treat this as a, as a regular class. So, you know, this is just a normal class. <laughs> Now, uh, last time we were talking about the Kansas. Turn that off. This time. Okay. So last time we were talking about the Kansas. Okay. Okay. And we were talking about how uh, in the Kansas territory, uh, under the Kansas Nebraska Act of 1854, uh, Congress said that the people who settled Kansas territory would get to decide whether or not slavery uh, would be allowed in the state of Kansas. Okay? That's what the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 said. It said that uh, the people who settled Kansas would eventually get to decide by voting whether or not slavery would be allowed in the state of Kansas. Okay? And uh, what this does, what the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 does, in effect, is it sets off a race. Okay? It sets off a race between two sides. <clears throat> and on one side, you have pro-slavery types running into Kansas. They want to get in there, and they want to settle down in Kansas. At the same time, <clears throat> you have free soilers and abolitionists. Rushing into Kansas, they want to sell Kansas. Why do they want to sell Kansas? Because if they get to sell Kansas first, then they'll get to vote in that election, and they will vote to make Kansas a free state. But if the pro-slavery types get to Kansas first, then they'll be able to vote and make Kansas a slave state. Okay. So both sides, the free soilers and abolitionists, and the pro-slavery types, are rushing to Kansas in the wake of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, trying to get there, because they realize the people who get there the firstest with the mostest, okay, will be able to decide whether or not Kansas becomes a slave state or a free state, okay? Now, one of the people who joined the abolitionist and free soil forces in Kansas uh, was this man, uh, John Brown. And we've already talked a little bit about John Brown. And here is a photograph of him. Okay. He looks like a pretty stern guy. He looks like a pretty serious guy. And he was. Okay. Um, now, Brown had gone to Kansas to join up with the abolitionists, uh, to join up with the Free Soilers. Okay. And he was outraged uh, in 1856. Uh, when he learned about the Sack Lords, okay, that is in, in 1856, when a pro-slavery mob had marched through, had rampaged through the streets of Lawrence, Kansas, and set fire to the hotel. He was outraged about that. And he was also outraged that the people who were in charge of Lawrence, Kansas, hadn't raised a finger in defense of their city. Okay, so he's upset about that. And what else he's upset about is he that he's upset over the fact that uh, Charles Sumner, senator from Massachusetts, the abolitionist senator from Massachusetts, had been caned until he was bloody on the floor of the U.S. Senate. Okay, uh, he was outraged when he learned that, that Sumner had been bloody at his desk. Okay, and so in May of 1856, just a few days, just a few days after Charles Sumner. Uh, had been beaten bloody at his desk. John Brown gets together a small band of followers. Okay? And he goes to a place in Kansas called Pottawatomie Creek. How do you spell that? Uh, Sound Goes to a place in Kansas called Pottawatomie Creek. And he and his band kidnap five pro slavery men five pro-slavery settlers from Pottawatomie Creek. Where is that? It's in Kansas. And it's a creek called uh, Pottawatomie Creek. Okay. He and his followers uh, kidnap five pro-slavery men and murder them with a sword. 
Okay, and this is known as the Pottawatomie Massacre. It occurs in 1856. And what the Pottawatomie Massacre does is that it inaugurates the beginning of uh, a shooting war in Kansas between, on the one side, free soilers and abolitionists, and on the other side, anti-slavery, okay, anti-slavery settlers. So starting in 1856, starting in the aftermath of the Pottawatomie Massacre, okay, there's violence off and on throughout Kansas. Okay. okay. Uh, by 1861, more than 50 people in Kansas had been killed in clashes between pro-slavery and anti-slavery settlers. Okay? Kansas becomes known as Bleeding Kansas. Okay? Every couple of weeks, you can open your newspaper, okay? and there will be color coverage of the latest fighting that's taken place in Kansas. Okay? Yeah? How many people were killed? Uh, about 50. Okay, now, uh, so what's happening in Kansas in the 1850s helps to focus the nation's attention on the issue of slavery, okay? Now, the following year, in 1857, the United States Supreme Court hands down a really, really important decision, uh, a decision that helps bring the nation one step closer to the Civil War, okay? 1857, and this decision was known as the Dred Scott Decision. Oh! Mm -hmm. I just learned it. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Dred Scott Decision. Um, and uh, it's about, yeah. In fourth grade, we did Missouri State Fair. Yes. And, uh -huh. um, yeah, so That's my project was yeah. the Old Courthouse, yeah. so we made up a song, um, and it was about Dred Scott, and it was so cool. Wow. 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 Should I sing it? Well, part of it. Uh, sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Once there was a famous case in the old protest, it did take place. It shook our nation to the core and brought us closer to the Civil War. Dread Scott. Dread Scott. Oh, flavor. Was he not? And then there's something about Supreme Court Justice Roger P. Cheney said in slavery he shall remain. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's it in a nutshell, right, right there. Right there. Um, yeah, uh, it's one of the most uh, famous uh, uh, cases in Supreme Court history, um, and it involves a slave uh, from Missouri, a slave named uh, Dred Scott. And that is Dred Scott right there. Okay, uh, Dred Scott was a slave uh, from Missouri. Okay, um, and what he does is uh, starting in the 1840s, in the 1840s, uh, he goes to court uh, to sue for his freedom. Okay? So in the 1840s, Dred Scott uh, goes to court with his lawyers to sue for his freedom. And he's not only suing for his freedom, uh, but he's uh, suing for the freedom of his wife, Harriet, and uh, right here, and his two daughters. Okay? Uh, this was a big case. Uh, this was a big case, and in fact, it made national headlines. This is from uh, a newspaper from 1857. Okay, so the whole country followed the Dred Scott case. Is this okay. in the north? No. What state is this in? Uh, where was Frank Leslie's? Uh, it says, "Thank you for going back to Congress in this." Uh, Southern District of New York. So it looks like it was published in New York. Okay? Now, uh, how did the Dred Scott uh, case make it all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court? Um, so here we need to take a step back to the 1830s and explain the background for the case. Okay? So, what happens is that in the 1830s, Dred Scott... Okay. In the 1830s, Dred Scott was a slave living in Missouri. And in the 1830s, Dred Scott is taken by his owner, who is a doctor in the U.S. Army. Dred Scott's owner takes Dred Scott from Missouri, which was a slave state, okay, takes him to Illinois, 